And so his son and I were actually in a band together and we wanted to make a record. And Sam was like, well, why don't you start a record label to put the record out on? And we were like, that's so cool. And what was really interesting was his son, Jackson, was really into the band. And it was like, I feel like I was really into the band until the moment Sam said that thing. After that, I was like, stuff the band. I'm, I'm, we're starting a record label. Hello, everyone. I am Rohit Bhargava, and you are listening to episode 163 of the Startup Playbook podcast, a weekly series where I sit down with successful tech founders, investors, and operators to unpack their journey, lessons, and insights to help current and future entrepreneurs. The voice that you heard a little bit earlier was that of Jaden Comerford, the founder and CEO of Unified Music Group, partner at SideStage Ventures, and our guest for this episode. Jadon launched Boomtown Records as a 17-year-old as a way to launch the first record for his own band. Fast forward 20 years later, and that business has now evolved to Unified Music Group, a leading independent music company that provides a range of services from everything like arts management and live events to merchandising and much more, to a range of local and international artists such as Vance Joy, Violent Soho and North Lane. Most recently, Jadon has teamed up with a bunch of superstars, namely Alex and Anthony Zachariah, the co-founders of Blinktree, Matt Allen, Ben Grabener, Emily Casey, and Kieran Rivett to launch Side Stage Ventures to invest in early stage ideas at the intersection of creativity and technology. In this episode, we dive deep into some of Jadon's lessons over the last 20 years in building Unified Music Group into a bootstrapped multi-million dollar international business, including how to scale through delegation, finding your niche, how to effectively and strategically expand your business, and what makes Jadon excited about potential investments. In this episode, I love Jadon's take on surrounding yourself with the right people so that you can take a step back and focus on the bigger picture. And that's why I'm excited to have partnered with Sender. I run all of my personal and business accounting through them and can say from first-hand experience how great it is to have a dedicated team to support me in this area. They're more than just an accounting firm and have a dedicated focus on founders, funders, and startups and can help you with everything from managing your taxes and balancing your books to even helping with your exit strategy. To find out more, head over to sender.com. And whether you're taking in funding from a VC fund, an angel investor, or a syndicate like Side Stage Ventures, you want to make sure you have the right legal infrastructure in place without having to pay a large chunk of new capital on legal fees. Law Parts Legal Advice Plan gives you access to a lawyer on demand for one low monthly fee. You can create documents, sign online, and even have a lawyer on call to help with any legal issues at a fraction of the cost. They've helped save Australian businesses over $100 million in legal fees and are offering listeners of this show 20% off their most popular plan. Head over to lawpath.com slash playbook to get access to this exclusive offer. And as you'll hear through this episode, one of the keys to Jadon's success has been surrounding himself with experts across all areas of his business. And that's why I'm excited to partner with Dovetail Studios. On top of being a renowned product development partner for startups like Afterpay, they also operate a VC fund to invest in early stage companies that go through their venture studio program. So if you're an early stage non-technical founder looking for a talented team to supercharge your growth, head over to dovetailstudios.com. With that out of the way, and without further ado, here is my interview with Jaden Cumberford. Hi, Jaden. Welcome to the Startup Playbook podcast, and thanks so much for taking the time to be on the show today. No worries, Rohit. Uh, thanks for having me. My pleasure. Um, so, Jaden, for those people that maybe aren't as familiar with you or your background, do you want to share a little bit about your story and what got you here today? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, firstly, stoked to be here today. So, yeah, once again, thank you. Um, but, yeah, my name is Jaden Cumberford, um, and I guess I'm most known as the CEO and founder of Unified Music Group, uh, which is an independent music company that's based here in Melbourne, Australia, but we've got teams all over the world. And yeah, I basically started it uh, as a little idea when I finished high school in 2002, as a little record label as a way to support local punk music in Melbourne. Uh, my bands, my friends' bands were playing in and stuff like that. And yeah, sort of one thing led to another and yeah, 20 years later, we've got over 80 staff and got a fully independent, fully independently funded uh, bootstrapped company. So yeah, kind of come a long way since then. Along the way, we've sort of grown from just being a record label to uh, managing talent, uh, doing merchandise, festivals, events, all sorts of things. Um, and we also started getting into investment as well. So in the venture space, 
um, recently co-founded uh, a business called Side Stage Ventures with some friends. And yeah, I've sort of done a bunch of different things, lived in the US for five years, uh, building the business over there. And yeah, now happily and proudly living in Melbourne. And uh, yeah, still plenty left in my journey, but that's a, a quick wrap up of uh, what I've been doing for the last 20 years. And as I'm sure the, the listeners can tell, uh, you know, so many fascinating parts of your journey that we'll dive into later in this episode. But one of the things that I wanted to um, get started with, uh, Jaden, is, you, you know, I think so much of our experience as kind of founders and, and kind of almost the way that we sort of view the world is shaped by a lot of our experiences growing up. And it was really fascinating uh, hearing you on another podcast talk about, um, you know, some of your own experiences uh, growing up, especially with your dad, um, you know, being an entrepreneur and, uh, you know, starting from, uh, I believe, a plumbing business and then moving over to, um, uh, to, to starting bakeries. Is that right? Yeah, that's it. That's, that's what dad did. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's, it's really sort of fascinating because, you know, growing up, I, I never, I've spoken about this on the podcast before, um, you know, my parents being Indian, um, you know, we never really spoke about entrepreneurship really being a career, but, you know, I benefited so much from my mom being very creative and, uh, you know, going with her to stores where she would, uh, you know, sell things and just learning so much from that process. I'm just really curious to sort of understand, um, you know, what were some of the things that you sort of took away or, or absorbed from um, seeing your dad or, or from your sort of parents supporting you early on? Yeah, definitely. Well, it was both my parents, um, you know, they ran the businesses together. Um, dad was more on the front line in terms of he was the plumber and then he was the baker. But yeah, mom and dad definitely worked together. And I think one thing that I've talked about is this idea of like, if you want to, if you want to get something done, just do it. Uh, because the main motivator for dad going from plumbing into bakeries, it was, it was actually into Baker's Delight, one of some of the earliest franchises. Uh, he just needed to make more money because he needed because he really wanted to send me and my two brothers to a private school, and so he literally was like, "Well, I've got to make more money, so I better do something else." And so, uh, and the coolest thing about it, just to prove how much of a legend my dad is and how non-materialistic he is, the second my youngest brother finished school, he quit the bakery, sold them all, and went back to being a plumber. Wow! So, um, I think like we often, you know are told to read books by like a lot of the great books that are behind you. I've, I've read them all. And, um, you know, we look up to all these incredible minds. Um, and, and it's good. It's great to, to, to know what, I don't know, Warren Buffett has for breakfast or something like that. But like, it's amazing what you can just learn from, yeah, from your parents and from people that are close to you that, that love you and care about you and that can teach you about some of the more simple things in life that are actually still incredibly scalable. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it was also really sort of fascinating to, to hear, you know, some of your own experiences with your dad about just working long hours. Um, you know, I had a very similar sort of experience. Funnily enough, my, my mom also started doing a lot of those things because she wanted to put me through private school as well after we moved back to Australia from, from Iran. And, um, you know, just seeing, as you mentioned, there, there's so much that you can learn from, you know, some of the bigger names, but, you know, seeing firsthand the amount of hours and work ethic that sort of my mom um, put through sort of really were, um, I guess, characteristics that I sort of really admired and, and wanted to sort of replicate for myself as well. Yeah, 100%. I, I totally agree with that. And uh, that idea of just getting it done, you know, aligning what your goals are, what your values are, and executing in that way is, is once again, it's something that's just so scalable, um, no matter how big or small you're thinking. Absolutely. And I mean, speaking of, um, you know, thinking big or small, you started uh, what was then sort of Boomtown Records, I believe, uh, as a 17 year old. Uh, you know, so much of, uh, of investing in talent, um, you, you know, a as, a, as what you do for work through Unified, but also investing in founders is, you know, almost being the first believer in, in someone. Um, who was that sort of first believer for you when you first got started, uh, either be an artist or, or a person that supported you early in your journey? Um, well, yeah, beyond my parents, because I, I, I should move on from, from that topic. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I guess I, the, yeah, the person that really helped me a lot was a guy called Sam Clark. Um, so he was a neighbor and he was the general manager at Shock Records. Um, and so his son and I were actually in a band together and we wanted to make a record. And Sam was like, well, why don't you start a record label to put the record out on? And we were like, that's so cool. And what was really interesting was his son Jackson was really into the band. 
And it was like, I feel like I was really into the band until the moment Sam said that thing. After that, I was like, stuff the band. I'm, I'm, we're starting a record label. And so we, uh, the idea was that we were, uh, wanted to put out another record before we put out our own band so we could sort of give the label some legitimacy. So we decided to do a compilation. And I think we put like a little ad in like the local street press, the beat magazine and, and asked artists to like send in their demo tapes. It was quite a, quite an old school kind of way of doing things. Cause we, you, you know, it wasn't, it was email, but it wasn't as you know commonly used as it is today. And one of the first bands that came through in that application was a band called wishful thinking, which ended up being the first band that we ever released on boomtown records. So I guess between, uh, wishful thinking, uh, who, you know, took a punt on us cause we were an unknown label and then Sam sort of giving us the, um, you know, the drive and the passion and also the introductions into like, um, you know, he, he had me meeting with the CEO of shock records and you know, at the time shock was like, you know, 250 people, like one of the biggest success stories of all time of Australian music. So yeah, there was some like really early ground floor days. Yeah. And, and what does that sort of look like? Um, you know, I guess as a 17 year old trying to convince bands to, to believe in you for them to sort of jump on as artists for you to manage. Uh, it was so long ago, to be honest with you. I couldn't tell it like it'd be interesting to go back and see what I said in those meetings, <laughs> <laughs> you know, how I actually turned up and how I presented myself. But I think, you know, in some ways, maybe there weren't that many other options for some of these bands. Um, and not that that was something we took advantage of, but I think it was more just, we were really excited about the music and, and you just met, met at that point. I remember we did the CD launch and it was a CD. It wasn't, it was before iTunes. We did the CD launch at the laundry, which is a, actually kind of like a nightclub on Johnson street in, uh, Fitzroy, but I think that was the only venue we could get, uh, for the launch. I think about 20 people turned up. So like, we were very much, you know, this, this band are awesome, great band, but it's not like I was out there trying to sign the Foo Fighters or something. We were, they were starting out, I was starting out and, um, and yeah, I just said, look, I'm going to work hard for you and I'm going to create opportunities for you. And I'll press your CDs even like I'll, I'll pay for that. You know, that, that in itself was, you know, a sign of investment, I guess, you know, actually putting cash into it and helping get, get the project off the ground. Yeah. And I guess, you know, how has that sort of evolved for you from the start um, in terms of the process or I guess what you look for in, in artists that you decide to back? Yeah. So I guess with where the business is at now, like, so I operate as the CEO, I work uh, directly on some artists, um, mostly uh, Vance Joy, uh, who I manage with my wife, Rachel. Um, and I co-manage Tash Sultana and, uh, represent her for the, for the U S um, and, and the Americas and work with a few other artists, but I don't really spend a lot of time myself actually picking artists anymore. I delegate that to the team, um, you know, delegate that to the experts, as I say, uh, because for me, you know, I'm spending so much more of my time on overall strategy for the business and how we're going to, you know, grow over the, you know, the, the foreseeable future. So for me, spending my time, you know, finding artists just wouldn't be scalable for me. So yeah, it's a really about having people in place that are, that are responsible for that. I'm still deeply passionate about it. I'm still deeply passionate about knowing who we're signing and I'm having lunch on Friday with one of our, um, new artists, Jack bots who's playing at the hotel on Friday night. Like I'm still very excited about having the relationships and, and being helpful to these young up and coming artists as well as our established artists. But um, yeah, I, unfortunately, I, uh, my, my leadership coach Hamish uh, said to me once, what got you here won't keep you here. You know, that's, a, I guess, an example of if I think if I was just, if I was just looking at artists all day long, I probably wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing at the scale that we're doing it. It's actually something that Matt Allen, um, who is a friend of the podcast and, and also one of your um, partners at uh, Side Stage Ventures as well, also uh, also mentioned about you is in terms of being a superpower is just your ability to be a really effective delegator um, in terms of tasks so that you can really focus on on building the bigger picture. I know that that's something that I struggled with in, in my own startup, and I'm sure that that's something that, um, you know, a lot of the, the listeners as well are conscious of and, and want to improve at. Um, do you have any suggestions in terms of how founders can get better at delegating or kind of systems or approaches that they can build up to, um, to build that as a skill. Yeah. I, I love delegating. It's like, it's actually kind of fun. I guess there's like a few lenses to look at it through, you know, if you try to do it, like there's those old sayings, like if you want something done right, you gotta do it yourself. Like I hate things like that. 
Um, like it might make sense to like, I don't know, like tying your shoe or like uh, making your lunch or something like that. But actually there's probably a, a chef that can make our lunch way better than I can. But, you know, the idea that you can uh, empower other people to do work with you is so exciting. Um, and I would oft, I'll often say to staff who are maybe doing their own delegating for the first time, or maybe they're having challenges with their own delegating, I might, I'll say something like, um, you know, the first time they do that task for you, it probably won't be good enough. Um, but if you give them feedback and you support them, they will learn from that and, and feel empowered by that. And they'll eventually do it better than you could have ever done it. And to me, that's how I see delegation. Like you essentially have all these tasks that need to be done and just sort of one by one, you're just passing them off to other people and allowing them to become the experts in all the different things that exist. So like when I first started, it was just me, right? Um, and so, but now we have HR, we have finance, we have legal, we have operations, we have marketing, we have, you know, digital, we have web three, we have investment, like, and this is all people owning all of these, these disciplines. And of course, like myself and others, you know, dip in and out of these areas. But yeah, you give someone the ability to do something themselves and just watch them shine. And if they don't, you give them feedback. And if you give them feedback and they don't, well, then, you know, you make changes. But yeah, I, I really enjoy uh, that that part of the job. I also love the way that you frame that as well in terms of knowing that, you know, it's unlikely that someone will be perfect from, from day one and that, you know, things will may not necessarily always go to plan, but just giving them the opportunity and feedback and trusting in the process that they'll get, that they'll improve over time and uh, they'll sort of learn from that and, and become better with experience. Are there particular things then that you sort of look for in, in uh, when you hire people into specific teams or people that you choose to work with uh, that help you um, really sort of lean into that? Yeah, I don't do a lot of hiring. Where I sort of do more of that is probably more in the uh, investment side of things in, in, in the side stage sense in terms of founders. But I, I know at Unified, like, you know, we're obviously, you know, for hiring for a lawyer, like we want someone that is a lawyer, obviously. Um, but we're very, very, very big on like people first. Like, you know, what are your values? Like what part of, what kind of team do you want to be a part of? Like, because you can't really teach that stuff or like you can only change someone so much and you don't want to change people if someone doesn't want to be a part of a certain culture like you know don't 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 do you or them the disservice of bringing them into that culture but yeah we're always looking at good people um we also have to find people that are from other industries and bringing other industries into music that's always quite interesting that's something that we're trying to do more of um not to say that we don't want to hire people that are already in the music industry, but it, it's a quite a small industry as it is. And often when you're doing that, you're probably just hiring someone from either one of your competitors or one of your friends' companies or, or, or both. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so yeah, bringing fresh people into the industry is something that we're also really passionate about. We have a, uh, a partnership with Call Arts, which is a uh, music uh, education uh, business, uh, sort of higher education uh, university. And we help bring like interns through the company. We give them work through our festivals and we're trying to use that as a way to bring the next generation of, of the industry through and, and, and into industry. Very cool. And, uh, you, you know, you touched on this a little bit earlier in terms of Unified Music being a bootstrapped business. I think you've also spoken about at the time when you launched the company, there weren't a lot of necessarily sort of funding options and, and it wasn't necessarily a path that you sort of looked at now. I guess now with your um, experience over the last 20 years and obviously investing through side stage and, and through the other investments that you make, knowing what you know now, would you have approached building the business in, in a different way? <laughs> yeah, probably actually. Uh, <laughs> it's, um, it's a good question and honestly, I might have said this somewhere before, but like, it, I don't know, I think it was about 2018, 2019 when I first heard the term bootstrapping. And at that point, it occurred to me that I was a, I was a bootstrapper, which sounds like it's really like, it sounds really like dirty or something. But I, um, yeah, I didn't know that there was any other way to do it. And I started off with $400 that I'd made from a job that I'd had um, and just somehow managed to uh, grow from there. I think the only backing I had was from, you know, MasterCard and Visa and whoever else would give me a credit card when I was running, running low. 
but yeah, I think it would be a great, it would, it would be fascinating to see what it would like firstly look like if I did go back and I had funding, but equally, I don't know who would have funded a 17 year old from Melbourne with an idea like this, but yeah, it's definitely been a, a big learning as I've gotten more into investing and more, uh, understood more about essentially how other businesses operate because the music industry is very much, at least until recently, it's been very dominated by the major labels. And I have no problem with major labels. We have artists assigned to all of them. Our label is distributed by The Orchard, which is owned by Sony Music. Um, but when there's so much concentration of power in you know a handful of entities, unless you're wildly successful, um, the terms of these sorts of deals that you might strike are gonna be very much in favor of, of those companies. And so for me, I was, I was, and still am very proudly independent and have never, never seen that really as a viable way to, to grow a business in terms of partnering with those big companies. Just to, uh, you know, I guess dive in a little bit deeper into to the investment side of things. I spoke to Nikki Skavak from Blackbird a, a few weeks ago. Um, and one of the things that we spoke about was, you know, both him and Rick didn't come from a traditional, uh, VC background. Um, they were essentially kind of the hungry, not the proven, and that's built into a core part of their philosophy in terms of how they look at investments. I'm just curious to sort of understand from your own uh, experience of, of building Unified, um, you know, how much of, of that experience has shaped how and what you look for when you invest through side stage or, or other investments that you make? Yeah, it's been a huge part of what, like how I've evolved, because essentially um, we, uh, you know, so we started the record label, we started the management company, we started the merch company. So we own those businesses 100%. We created a partnership with two brothers, Aiden and Rep McLaren, uh, to launch Red Hill Entertainment, which is our festival business. Uh, and we also invested in a, a software company uh, on the Central Coast, which makes like music uh, production software. Uh, and we're also partners in that business. So that was sort of up until about 2016, where we sort of like, uh, we were either own a hundred percent or owned a, you know, uh, less than 50%, but a significant share of these companies. And essentially all of that was motivated by just growing our footprint, uh, and working with people that I guess we believed in or really had affinities with. Um, but it wasn't until I guess I wrote my first angel check that I really started to realize just how, um, how similar it was to signing artists, uh, or, or developing talent within the business. And it just became something that I became really passionate about in terms of finding founders that were solving problems that I found were interesting, oftentimes problems that are solving for the music industry. Um, and just seeing people coming in with different perspectives and seeing how much I could learn from these people. Um, that was essentially what I guess drove my initial, um, uh, and, and still to this day, like passion and sort of instinct for, for investing. Yeah, and I guess on the podcast, and for those of you that are watching the video version of this or have seen video versions of this before, you can probably see the big uh, or the large amount of Liverpool paraphernalia behind me. Um, and we've spoken about, you know, the the correlation between sports and, uh, and startups. And, uh, you know, obviously... I, th I think that there are so many similarities between musicians and artists and, and startup founders as well. I, I guess from your perspective, you know, what are some of the similarities between successful artists and successful founders that you have either worked with or have decided to back? Yeah, for sure. Congrats on the win, by the way. Um, I don't Thank follow you. soccer or football, but I've, I think Liverpool might be my team because uh, so many of my friends go for Liverpool. Um, yes, we, we need to onboard you. I'm going to uh, going to the UK in two weeks uh, and hoping to be there in person when they win the Champions League final. So that's I think it's very crossed. exciting. <laughs> um, so the similarities. So I guess you know artists, um, are, you know they're deeply passionate about their art um, and they're trying to pursue, you know, arguably what's a relatively non conventional career path. The idea of making a living from making music or by making a living from art is is not something that the majority of society gets to do. And so I think you could probably say the same thing about uh, startup founders. Um, you know, many people make a living being entrepreneurs or owning businesses, but there's only a handful of startups that actually make it, right? Like it's a very speculative industry. So for someone to say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend the next 10 years of my life trying to make this idea stick, 
um, that's something that's um, that's where I think music and and startup founders uh, really converge. And, and I think that's the space where I'm like, well, if you're going to have a punt, then so am I. And I'm going to see how I can help you, um, how I can help invest in you and help build your career. Yeah. And I guess, you know, uh, one of the similarities that you can sort of cross over is that, uh, you know, punting on, on people, I guess, what are some of the the differences when it comes, um, either in terms of environmentally or structurally, uh, when you're deciding to, to work with an artist or when you're working with an artist compared to when you're investing in a startup? Uh, structurally, you mean in terms of deals? In terms of deals or, um, you know, even just the environment. So you kind of touched on the, you know, the fact in the music industry, a, a large part of it is controlled by, you know, very specific sort of organizations or, or people. Um, how do you sort of, I guess, competing in that or, or working in that sort of environment is uh, challenging. So I'm just wondering, you know, I guess what, what are some of the, the correlations of the learnings that you can take from either music and apply to investing or, or vice versa? Yeah, I think you just got to find your your niche or find what you offer. Like side stage, I think has carved out a, a specific area of the market, an area that others invest in. But I think we've sort of kind of created our own, uh, our own narrative around, you know, culture, creativity and technology. Um, like once again, other investors will invest in these same companies, but that's an area that we really want to be known for. And same with music. Like we, uh, we're not Sony, we're not Warner, we're not universal, but we can still, you know, help you build a successful career, but like also in the same way that some founders don't, um, see eye to eye with investors. Also some artists don't see eye to eye with, with, with certain companies. Some artists want to be signed to the, the really big company or, or some people want to be signed to the really small company. Like, so we're kind of in the middle, you know, some artists will come into our office and be like, Oh no, this isn't the right vibe for us. Whereas others will. And so I think you just need to like present who you are and present the way you want to be and know that there's always going to be, um, there's always going to be enough business. There's always going to be enough founders to invest in. There's always going to be enough artists to sign and not in a way that's sort of like trying to talk about this as, you know, their numbers, not people. It's nothing like that. It's just more that, you know, you can't do everything. You can't sign or invest in everybody. Uh, you need to focus on what you're really good at and just go on doing that. Yeah. And um, I, I think you've, you mentioned this story in another podcast interview where I believe that you were in the US trying to push uh, Vance Joy. And I think you had a day where all of your meetings got, got cancelled. And I think that that's, you know, such a uh, familiar story for probably a lot, a lot of listeners on the podcast where sometimes you just have days where, um, you know, things just don't go to plan or, or large periods where it's really difficult to kind of see where you come around the, the other side of that. Do you have any advice in terms of things that have helped you through that process uh, as well or some of the artists that you've worked with that have helped you sort of overcome through some of the more challenging parts of the journey? Yeah, it's tough because for me, like I'm a really pretty self-starting kind of, you know, sort of, you know, rev the engine in the morning and I get going pretty quickly. Um, pretty much all of that, all the time. I'm, I'm a, I'm a early riser. I'm a yoga meditator kind of person, but yeah, but when, when I do get stopped in my tracks by something, it does, it really does affect me. Uh, and I do remember that day we, I was, I was just moved to New York, hadn't yet got a lease on an apartment. So it was Airbnb being, down in Chinatown, uh, which is an awesome area, um, but it's pretty chaotic and loud and and all that. And uh, yeah, just one by one, my day just fell apart. And I was just, I just remember lying there on this bed, just thinking, what the hell am I doing here? Like, this is, you know, um, but you know, for me, I don't know how I would have got myself out of that. Maybe I went to a yoga class. Maybe I hit up a buddy and went and drank a bunch of beers. I'm, I'm not sure, um, probably not that one, but, but quite possibly later <laughs> that evening. Um, but yeah, I think it's just, you just got to keep going, but you know, equally, you know, everyone's made differently and everyone has different challenges. And, you know, I count myself very lucky and very grateful that I, I do have quite a lot of self motivation and yeah, cause it's not easy. You know, you try Once again, you're trying to do something that you're probably not meant to be doing, uh, in terms of you're trying to really push something beyond what the sort of natural environment is, is trying to make it. So. Yeah, I think it's like, remember, you know, refocus why you're doing it, trying to remind yourself what inspires you about it. 
um, and I guess just try to encourage yourself to to do to keep going. But then I, and then then the, at the end of it as well, you also just need to be kind to yourself, and sometimes just acknowledge that things are hard, things are tough, um, and sometimes you just got to you know get through that and and find a way. Yeah, whether it's ice cream or or running or something that's going to make you feel a bit better, or sometimes maybe you just need to sit there or lie there and just feel like shit for a bit and and just deal with it yeah absolutely i think i think um you're absolutely spot on i think everyone's got a, a slightly different way of, of kind of approaching it and, and no uh situation is, is the same but you know i personally find that running is super helpful um i know that you've mentioned this on another podcast as well but um you know i'm very fortunate to have a lot of my very close friends uh, are still friends from high school as well and actually just having people that aren't connected to my work that are really close to me and that I really sort of care about also helps me sort of detach from things that, that may be sort of, um, you know, difficult work-wise and, and those sorts of things as well. So just kind of finding that, that right balance and, um, you know, just finding ways to, to take a little bit of a break and, as you said, being kinder to yourself as well. Yeah, 100%. So, you know, we've kind of touched on SideStage a little bit earlier. So uh, for those people that aren't familiar, um, SideStage just launched recently with uh, a couple of the guests that I've had on the podcast before. So Matt Allen and Alex Zachariah being two of the, the co-founders. Do you want to share a little bit about what SideStage does and uh, I guess the, the story behind how it all got started? Yeah, for sure. So we're um, community, community-based investing, which, you know, the other term is that we're a syndicate, we're an investment syndicate. But essentially what we're doing is, yeah, we're building a, a community of people, like-minded people that want to invest alongside us in companies that are working in and around the intersection of creativity, technology, and culture. So basically where we got started was uh, Alex um, and his brother, Anthony, uh, and I have been friends for many years. And we co-invested together in 2018 in two Melbourne music tech startups, one Muso and the other Tixel companies that are doing very well, both recently launched in the UK uh, and doing very well in Australia as well. But we, yeah, very passionate about that idea. And you really wanted to sort of build something uh, to support founders, but also to build a community around it. We're all busy people, you know, me running Unified, them running Bolster, and then eventually launching Linktree, which ended up becoming, you know, and has become, you know, one of Australia's most successful startup stories of the last recent times. Um, but yeah, it was in COVID of, uh, in 2020, we're all in Melbourne and, uh, I met Matt Allen through Alex and Anthony, and we started catching up on zoom on Saturday afternoons and like talking about the founders that we wanted to invest in. Um, very nerdy, very, um, very, you know, on brand for COVID lockdown, people were doing all sorts of things. People were making croissants or learning languages. And we were, we were talking about startups and the first one that came up was Mr. Yum. Alex was friends with Adrian Osman, one of the founders, uh, and we ended up all wanting to invest. And there was a few other people on the call by that point. And what we realized was that we we did, we weren't going to be able to get seven or 12 or whatever cap table entries uh, on this fast growing startup. We were going to have to figure out a way to um, do to do a, a syndicate. And so that was essentially what was the beginning of side stage ventures. Uh, and so over over the COVID period, we invested in Heaps Normal, we invested in QSIC, we invested in Vitruvian, um, and slowly but surely, we gathered more team members. Uh, we we struck a deal with 1013, who are a, a much larger syndicate based out of Brisbane, who do all of our back end and syndication, and we essentially use them as an investment partner, but also as a essentially a, a solution. And we we've sort of building side stage on top of their their stack and. Um, they're doing great stuff and yeah so that's that's what we're doing where we, we launched in april um uh we did a, a party at the corner hotel in in may at the start of may uh to launch the business and um yeah here we are just just doing what we're doing doing what we've been doing for a long time but just with more structure and and with a vehicle behind it which has been a really great uh exciting thing to bring out into the world again um Jaden, you, you touched on this a little bit earlier uh you know i think from a uh, from finding your niche perspective, there are so many different options now for capital for for founders, which is great. Do you want to sh- talk a little bit about how you know Site Stage separates itself itself out, or kind of your your sort of focus area for the syndicate? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, we 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 operate, you know, like a traditional investor uh, in that we yeah will invest capital into your business, whether you're angel syndicate, 
venture capital, but we, um, I don't know, I guess we're just trying to get in early and find companies that really need, need that support early on. It's the, not, not that we wouldn't invest in later stages like we 100% would, but yeah, we're really just trying to be, uh, an investment company that, you know, founders that are right at the beginning want to reach out to. We obviously can't do every deal that comes to us. Um, that would be impossible, but it's tempting because there's just so many great, great founders out there. Um, but yeah, we're just sort of looking for, yeah, particularly like we love technology. Technology is, you know, such a big part of, of, of our world. But that, we just keep playing around with this idea of creativity, uh, which is a relatively like opaque word in some ways. But we're just trying to find really great founders that are creating interesting solutions for problems that they think are worth solving. And yeah, we just want to kind of be there. And, and for me, you know, side stage, is, it's sort of a bit like a record label in that we're also really curating, you know, the founders that we work with. And so we want people to feel really proud to be a part of side stage and when you go to our site, you know, you sort of look at the companies and you sort of maybe see a, a thread that sort of ties them together. And, you know, that's, that's really what we're, we're looking to do is build that community around the, the founders as well as the investors. And, um, you know, as you mentioned, any investor can't invest in, in everyone, but you have built up a, an incredible portfolio in founders already within such a short time period. Do you want to share what are particular things about companies or founders that get you personally really excited and, and want to take them um, on the journey with side stage? Well, you take, we talk about creativity, like say someone like, like heaps normal, you know, like Andy Miller, he's just such a, who's the CEO, just such an inspiring uh, individual. I don't know if you've seen that this is not normal campaign that they launched um, to basically, was it call to action to society to, you know, to vote with climate change in mind with the current federal election and just to see a you know a private company take that kind of initiative to build that campaign and, and lobby other like-minded companies to get on board and and sign the pledge like you know i know that none of that's commercial none of that is uh you know sort of uh i guess in the business plan so to speak but equally like that's the kind of thing that not only makes the world a better place but it will make heaps normal a more important brand and a more valuable brand to society and, and to investors so that kind of creativity is just really, really exciting. And yeah, just people that, um, you know, like Kim from Mr. Yum, like, you know, such a huge vision, um, you know, really coding to the US um, at the beginning of 2021, you know, right in, in amongst all of the COVID that was happening. It was kind of like, you know, it was, it was such a big statement from her to say, no, I'm going to go over there and, and get this business going um, because that market's opening up. So yeah, people that are driven and, and smart and creative, it's just, it's honestly just inspiring to be able to work with these people and, and speak to them on a regular basis. Yeah, and, and as you mentioned, you know, at, at the pre-seed and seed stage, a lot of those companies and founders are really early. What are sort of indicators that you look for that the founders have those sort of creative elements or um, are in, in your mind really backable founders that, again, you want to get behind? Yeah, I guess someone once said, I think Nick Crocker said it. It's like, do you believe, does this person envisage, envision the future um, that they describe? Or is that, did I say that right? Basically, can they see the future? You know, and do you, do you see them being able to turn this deck into a reality, essentially? Because that's huge. You know, like for someone to say, oh, yeah, I'm going to build heaps normal, a non alcoholic beer company. And now to get it to where it is, um, you know, that takes, you need to believe in what the problem they're solving is. You need to believe in whatever their MVP is. You need to believe in the, you know, the market and the, whatever traction there might be at the time. But yeah, I, I always say there's like, there's good ideas, but then there's execution. Um, and, you know, execution is really where the founders come in. Um, and of course the team as well, but you know, cause we can, you and I can have good ideas all day long, but if we don't go and do anything about it, it's not going to amount to anything. So, um, yeah, I think that's kind of, uh, I can't remember what the question was, but that, that, that was what I, what, what I, what I, what I guess I look for, I think was the question. What do you look for in founders? That that's what I'm looking for. People that I believe can actually take this great idea and turn it into something. 
from a founder perspective, because a majority of the, the listeners of the show are probably sort of founders that are relatively early in their journey and, and are looking, um, you know, within the next sort of six to, to 12 months to raise capital from investors like SideStage. Um, you know, what are some things that they can demonstrate when they potentially don't have markers like revenue or haven't been around sort of long enough to, to have um, a long sort of history there? What are ways that they can sort of demonstrate their credibility or their ability to, to execute to you? Um, I guess there's always, you can start with like prior experiences is is helpful. It, it, some people uh, will see the opposite. They might say like, well, if they've already been a successful founder, you know, are they hungry enough to do it again? But I think that showing that someone's done it before or, or, or just understanding what their prior skills is, that's always really helpful. I think like one of the best things to happen, I think, recently is loom um you know actually like presenting what your because it's you know we don't always have time for a zoom call with every single founder that reaches out but if you could share as a loom link or any any type of video link presenting what you're doing like that's a re i find like that's a really good way to get your your story across because that's really what it's about it's like we can read decks all day long but actually hearing from the founder and hearing from their own work in their own words like that's that's something that's very helpful yeah, I, I actually love that, love that bit of advice as well. And especially, you know, I guess given that, um, you know, you are the CEO of, of Unified, uh, Alex and Anthony are, are continuing to run Linktree, which is runaway success as well. I imagine that you don't have, um, you know, all the time to sort of sit down and, and review pitch decks or, or review sort of all of the companies that, that come across uh, side stage as well. Um, do you want to, can you share a little bit of what that sort of process looks like from when someone gets in touch with, with side stage to potentially putting an investment together for them? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And you're right. Like we don't have time to look at everything in, in the, you know, in the detail that we would like to, um, but essentially the, they come in and, and, we discuss them um, at our like weekly investment meeting, um, and yeah, if someone's really passionate about something, they'll bring it up and they'll they'll try to essentially get the group on board. And usually, then what we'll do is follow up. Maybe by then that person's had a call with the founder or founders, uh, and then if that's the case, then usually the next stage would be that we would get at least one other partner to also meet uh, those founders, and then we sort of go from there. So. Um, yeah, firstly, it's just about getting at least one of us really pumped up on the idea so we can essentially start, you know, doing the work internally to, to sell it to the rest of the team. And, you know, we've, we've spoken about this on, uh, on a couple of interviews recently, but, you know, I think it's always interesting to hear perspectives from different investors on this as well, especially considering that, uh, you know, you and, and a lot of the other partners are, are really busy as well. What is the right time for, for founders to, to reach out to you? Is that something that they should be getting in way ahead of, you know, their planned uh, opening for their round? Or, or is this more closer to, to when they're sort of really ready to, to take on capital that, that you'd rather they reach out to you? That's a good question. I, I, if I'm being honest with you, I don't know if I've been doing this long enough to know how to answer that question properly. Um, but I think, you know, the, what comes up for me is put your best foot forward. I think, you know, if you've got a killer idea and you feel really strongly about it, but you're not going to raise for a while, like, sure, let us know about it. But I think if you're going to bring something to an investment company, you want to be as prepared as possible. Sometimes people come in a rush or we need to close really soon. Um, that might be because they've got already got a lead or something like that. So we completely understand that. But I think, yeah, I think you just put your best foot forward and, and, and really try to, I guess, uh, sell it in a way that you think is believable. And I guess a good way to probably do that would be to probably practice on, you know, friends and family or other sort of colleagues in the industry. Yeah, that's that's probably the best way to look at it. And shifting gears slightly, you touched on, um, you know, the, the various different businesses within Unified that, that you run as well. From a founder perspective, you know, the, the general advice is usually to focus on one area before you sort of expand out into, into different areas of the business. Uh, what did that process look like for you, especially as a, as a bootstrap founder, um, you know, I guess having to put your own capital on the line and shift in your own team's focus or bringing on additional team members? Do you have any lessons in terms of timing or approach in expanding businesses and, and you know, both when the right time is and, and how to execute on that properly? Yeah, for sure. Well, early on, it was all really just like what we, we would refer to it as an organic evolution. So 
um, the first band I talked about, Wishful Thinking, that was signed to Boomtown Records, which is a record label which releases records. They decided they needed a manager, uh, and I was the only person they knew in the music industry, so they asked me to be their manager. So I said yes, and so overnight, Boomtown Records went from being a record label to being a record label and a management company. And so a number of those sorts of things happened through the early stages of the business as it grew. Uh, obviously, as things got further along and things got bigger, it gets a lot more intentional. You know, we create business plans and you know budgets and cash flows and forecasts and all that sort of stuff. I guess where Unified is now at is, um, I think I shared this with you last week when we caught up, but um, what we're building is an ecosystem for creative talent to thrive. So the way that we look at uh, our business is that we're we're an ecosystem of companies providing different services to the industry. And so we believe that we don't necessarily need to be your one-stop shop. We are totally down with doing just your merchandise or just your records or just, but we want to be able to provide an ecosystem that can service lots of different types of talent. And so that's why we're building what we're doing. Uh, early on at certain stages, I definitely would have um, been distracted from certain things. Oh, we've got to do this now. Let's go do that. We, we can't miss out on this opportunity. Usually that usually those sorts of moments were mistakes. They they weren't thought through enough and they didn't give us the right result because we didn't give it the right attention. But now with this sort of focus on building this ecosystem, it, it's very clear and very intentional. It's like, well, what's next? You know, you know, if this truly is an ecosystem, well, what's missing and, and how do we how do we plant the right seeds to, you know, to really grow and, and nurture this ecosystem? So um, so we got it, we managed to shift from just like a heap of companies doing a bunch of stuff to, although they're still separate companies, it's able to be viewed within an overall strategy. Um, and that's become very clarifying for the team as to how we, we roll that out and how we maintain that ecosystem. Yeah. And again, like, I think that story is something that probably resonates with a lot of founders that are listening to this as well, uh, where sometimes you just have opportunities that come up and it almost seems uh, you know, too good to pass up and, and something that you should really go after. And, um, you know, unfortunately things aren't necessarily thought out enough and, um, you know, isn't a, a really sort of good return on investment from either a time or a resource perspective. I really sort of like your kind of strategic approach in terms of doing that. What has, uh, you know, some of the lessons of maybe going after those opportunities that didn't go, didn't quite work out into a more strategic approach. What does that look like for you now in terms of, you know, is that mapped out over a, two, three, five year period, or is that still something that kind of combines the opportunities that come up with sort of assessing whether that's an opportunity really worth going after? Yeah, look, it's a bit of both. Like once you say you're an investment company, like a lot of investments come your way. Um, that's one thing that I've learned, uh, which is a really good thing. So as a result, we'll never be short of opportunity. But yeah, focus is is obviously very key. So yeah, like we have longer term goals, but equally, I don't want to get too stuck on like, yeah, in 2027, we're going to launch a vinyl pressing plan. And in 2028, we're going to launch a, you know, who knows what it's going to be by then. Because I think that you need to be able to move those things around. Um, we're probably working more like, I think, 12 months in advance for like specific projects. Uh, we've got two major projects that we're building at the moment. One is uh, Web3 and gaming. Um, and the other is, uh, more around sort of uh, creating efficiencies around our marketing uh, efforts as, a, as an entire group. Um, so they're like major projects that are being developed with their own business plans, with their own budgets and their own people and stuff like that. And we'll continue to sort of do things like that that will help continue to bolster the ecosystem. Fantastic. And again, sort of going back to something that we spoke about a little bit earlier in this episode in terms of when you were speaking of delegation and just making sure that you have the right people around you as well. Uh, again, similarly, I, I heard on a podcast recently that you had one of your team members that celebrated 16 years and another that had celebrated, I think it was about 11 years or so uh, with the company as well. Um, do you want to share what, I guess, internal operationally, you know, what are some of the things that, that you do in terms of building the culture or, or kind of building the team in the right way that ensures that you can um, retain and, and keep your, your best performing uh, team members? Firstly, we just try to invest in good people um, and, you know, just genuinely try to build their careers. Like I 
talked about um, talent being artists and founders, but also our team members is, is talent for us as well. And we need to constantly be investing in these people and finding ways to, to build their careers or otherwise they'll leave. Uh, and that happens, of course. I guess like there's a bunch of different ways to answer that question. There's sort of the formal sides of check-ins and reviews and talent maps and all those sorts of things. You know, internally from a culture perspective, uh, we, we spend a lot of energy on um, sort of like climate issues and like diversity initiatives. So in terms of like making sure we are continuing to make sure the company is existing for more than just making money. That's something that's really important to me uh, and really important to, you know, to most people, if not all people at the company. And yeah, I think, I think first and foremost though, um, it's about giving people like create, it's about creating an ecosystem for creative talent to thrive. You know, it's actually about giving them the tools, giving them the support so they can actually see themselves being here long into the future. And then you do all the other stuff around it, the, the sort of birthdays and the, and the, the cultural events and all these other things that, you know, add to the experience. But ultimately, it, ultimately you go to work to work and you're attracted to a company because you think that it's going to be a good place to build a career. And so to me, that's, that's on the, on the, the leaders of that business to make sure it's a great place to be. And I think we've had our ups and downs. I don't think we've always been perfect. We've definitely failed at times. Um, but I think we've also been very successful in other ways and have managed to retain some pretty incredible talent for, uh, you know, over a, a long period of time. So that's something that we're, we want to do more of. Fantastic. On that note, Jaden, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and for sharing your experience and insights. For anyone that wants to find out more, say hello, get in touch. What's the best way for them to do that? Um, I don't know. Um, I'm pretty bad at like checking things uh, in terms of like Instagrams and LinkedIn's and stuff like that, but I'm on there. You just search Jaden. There's not many Jadens out there, so you'll find me pretty easily. And you can probably guess my email address as well um, at unifiedmusicgroup.com. But yeah, I'm around, so you'll, you'll track me down uh, if, if you really want to. Perfect. Well, I'll, I'll make sure I add a link to that into the show notes. Once again, Jaden, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. It's been a pleasure. No worries. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Thanks for listening to episode 163 of the Startup Playbook podcast. All of the show notes from this episode, as well as additional content where I'll dive deeper into some of the topics discussed in this, as well as previous podcast episodes, will now be available at startupplaybook.substack.com. I'll be back next week with another episode, but in the meantime, if you enjoyed this interview, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. As always, thank you for tuning in, and I'll see you next week.